Good morning, good day, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining our first MIRI seminar on current affairs in 2024, which will feature a book talk on a good Jew, bad Jew, racism, anti-Semitism, and the assault on the meaning with Professor Stephen Friedman. My name is Svetlusha Surova, and I'm the founder and senior researcher at Minority Issues Research Institute. Here at MIRI, we are dedicated to conducting research on minority issues and promoting minority rights worldwide. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome our esteemed speaker, Professor Stephen Friedman. A warm welcome also to all of you joining, joining this event. Before I hand over the floor to the professor, allow me to introduce him briefly. Professor Stephen Friedman is a research professor at the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Johannesburg. He is a political scientist who specializes in the study of democracy. He has written widely on South Africa's transition to democracy and on the relationship between democracy, social inequality, and economic growth. He has emphasized the role of citizens' voices in strengthening democracy in his work. And also he has written many books, and I will mention only a few. His book, Building Tomorrow Today, is a study of South African trade union movement and its impact on democracy. In his book, Race, Class and Power, Harold Wolpe and the Radical Critique of Apartheid, published in 2015, Professor Friedman studied South African radical thought. He has also examined the democratic theory in his book, Power in Action, Democracy, Citizenship and Social Justice, published in 2018. And in another book, Prisoners of the Past, published in 2021, he discussed South Africa as a path dependent democracy. And also, in the same year, uh, he has written a book on the COVID 19 pandemic in South Africa. Today, Professor Stephen Friedman will present his newest book, published at the end of the last year by Wits University Press. Uh, which is entitled, as I already mentioned uh, at the beginning, Good Jew, Bad Jew, Racism, Antisemitism, and the Assault on the Meaning. In this book, Professor aims to illustrate how members within the group can try to impose an identity on others by inventing their own understanding of racism. And he observes how the term antisemitism has been redefined, shifted, and even detached from its original meaning. And this new antisemitism he sees as a product of the Israeli state. So, Professor, uh, can you present to us now your main claims of the book and the arguments that underpin them? The floor yes, is thank, clear. Thanks, very, thanks very much. And, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to engage with you on the book. Um, you will, if you were listening to <coughs> the the introduction, um, there doesn't seem to be particularly strong connection between what I usually write about in this book. Um, but I think that there is a, a very strong connection because the purpose, I mean, you've heard a bit about the purpose of the book, but uh, the question of identity, race, identity, ethnicity, uh, religion very often uh, is, is a central question to democracy because uh, the, in my view, a democratic society is one which recognizes the humanity of all, all human beings. And uh, we know that that humanity uh, is not always recognized. In fact, very often is not recognized. Um, and because I'm South African, uh, and we have a history, of course, of, of, of racial division and racial domination, uh, questions of race and identity have always interested me. And uh, uh, that is one reason why uh, Palestine and its effect on Jewish identity is of interest to me. Now, the reason I wrote this book is twofold. I mean, the one is very specific uh, and the other one is more general. Um, let me talk more about the general one uh, just for a moment. Uh, and the general one is that if we go back into the history of racial prejudice, um, we find that, you know, for, for, for certainly for the last hundred years or so, uh, since uh, a group of uh, German writers at that stage purported to come up with something which they, they called race science, which claimed to demonstrate 
uh, that uh, white people were superior to all others. And that since that period, uh, people who uh, harbor racial prejudice, prejudices towards uh, black people, towards Jews, towards uh, uh, you can, on, in the European experience, you can fill in the names for yourself, um, <clears throat> have tended to be quite open about their belief uh, that the group which they are stigmatizing is inferior or corrupt or evil or whatever uh, particular slander they want to, to visit upon the group. Uh, for quite a while now, this has changed. Uh, and, and the way in which it is changed is that uh, people who harbor the racial prejudices uh, have taken to blaming their critics for racial prejudice. Um, so to give an example, <coughs> in the 1970s in the United States, uh, attempts to open up medical school opportunities uh, for black Americans uh, was the subject of uh, court action by white Americans who claimed that they were the victim of racial discrimination uh, because the appointment of black, uh, sorry, the recruitment of black students at medical schools uh, meant that they were being favored over whites. Uh, and this is only one example. I mean, in, in, in Europe, you will be familiar over the last few years, for example, about uh, arguments about uh, uh, the statues of slave owners and, and, and how that particular experience should be understood. Um, so that what started as a complaint about admission policies at American universities has become a much wider trend. Um, and uh, very often people who, who harbor clearly uh, prejudiced views uh, against race, uh, find it against other races, find it useful to stigmatize uh, the 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 the, uh, the critics of their racism by by accusing them of racial discrimination. And one reason, one of many reasons for looking at this in the Jewish context and the context of of the Israeli state and uh, the effect that it's had on Jewish identity is that this particular trend is particularly marked uh, when we look at uh, attitudes to uh, racism directed at Jews. Now, I'm sure everybody here will be familiar, particularly after the events of the last few months, when obviously all of these uh, issues have been amplified to a large extent, uh, that it has become very uh, customary now, very common uh, for people to be accused of anti-Semitism. Uh, anti-Semitism is a very bad term, incidentally, because it really, uh, it's, it's of course, refer, refers to prejudice or hatred of Jews. Uh, incidentally, most, I, most, I didn't want to get into that debate in the book, most scholars of anti-Semitism today, or the scholars of anti-Semitism who I think are, 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 are the most competent, tend to point out that it's not a very good term. Uh, besides which Palestinians are Semites as well, if you want to use that kind of language. Uh, but in any event, that's the term that is used and that's the term that's familiar to people. And we know uh, that people uh, who uh, are critical of the Israeli state uh, are very often accused of being anti-Semite. Um, and what I found particularly interesting about this is one of the reasons I wrote the book uh, it, it so happened that uh, a lot of these issues uh, became very controversial in the British Labour Party at a particular point. And one of the things that became clear when the British Labour Party went through its so-called anti-Semitism crisis is that somebody calculated uh, that if you were a Jewish member of the Labour Party, your chances of being expelled for being an anti-Jewish racist, in inverted commas, were 20 times higher than if you were not a Jewish person. And so this is uh, puzzling. Uh, why should members of an ethnic group be more likely to be accused of uh, hating that ethnic group or being prejudiced against that ethnic group uh, than other people? So, so that was the first puzzle. Secondly, when you looked at the expressions of anti-Semitism 
so-called expression of anti-Semitism, he found something quite interesting, which is that these expressions of anti-Semitism were not in the main expressing hatred towards Jews at all. They were expressing opposition of, 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 of various degrees to the Israeli state and the practices of the Israeli state. So, so uh, what seemed to have been happening is that uh, the term anti-Semitism was no longer uh, directed at people who hated Jews, it was directed at people who opposed the Israeli state. The other puzzle which needs to be explained is that many of the people at the moment, and I'm talking about international political figures, who are most enthusiastic about the Israeli state really are anti-Semitic. In other words, they really dislike Jewish people or they harbor prejudices against Jewish people. Now, I begin the book because that really illustrates the point that I've tried to make starkly uh, by going back to the events of, uh, of January the 6th, 2021, when, of course, Donald Trump uh, claimed that he'd been uh, cheated out of winning the American election and tried to challenge that. And there was the infamous attempt to storm the Capitol. Now, uh, if you look at the accounts of that day and the pictures, you see something rather peculiar. On the one hand, some of Trump's supporters are wearing T-shirts which say six million was not enough, which, of course, refers to the six million Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. Uh, others are wearing T-shirts which are, which are labeled Camp Auschwitz, which, of course, was the Nazi death camp. So they are, in effect, cheering on the Nazis and complaining that the Nazis didn't murder enough Jewish people. On the other hand, they're carrying Israeli flags, which which is is, is interesting. Okay, uh, and one could mention various international figures. Uh, uh, you know, Viktor Orban in Hungary has conducted a, a sort of very anti-Semitic campaign against George Soros, uh, but yet he is a very staunch uh, friend of the state of Israel. And uh, Vijay Bolsonaro, former president of, of of Brazil, who claimed that. Uh, Jews hadn't been murdered by the Nazis, that simply died of cold and hunger in the concentration camp, uh, was also a very strong friend, and, and so one could go on. So the book is an attempt to make sense of this very odd puzzle that people uh, who are of a particular ethnic group are accused of being haters of that ethnic group, uh, and people find it very easy, on the one hand, uh, to uh be uh prejudiced against Jews uh but very sympathetic to the Israeli state and, and I find the answer uh, in the intellectual history if you like of the Zionist movement which is the movement which created the state of Israel on the one hand and the evolution of all the changes in various European attitudes uh, towards Jews. And I think the best starting place to explain this uh, is, is to go back to the end of the last of, of the century before last, the end of the 19th century. Now, this remember, Jews have been in Europe for a very long time. They've obviously been in other places too, but they've been in Europe for a long time. And for most of that time, uh, they've been in Europe, but not of Europe, um, in the sense that, that for most of that time, they have been regarded as a distinct group, which may be living in Europe, but is not really quite European. And, and of course, Jews used to live in ghettos and, uh, and, 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 and segregated areas, etc. Uh, from the time of the Enlightenment, when, of course, the idea of the modern liberal democratic state was introduced and the idea of equal citizenship was introduced, restrictions began to uh, be removed from Jews. However, it became evident at that time uh, that the acceptance was at best partial. And a lot of this crystallized uh, in the late 19th century uh, in the Dreyfus Affair. And the Dreyfus Affair involved a man called uh, Dreyfus, who was a colonel in the French army, a Jewish colonel in the French army, was accused of treason uh, entirely falsely. And after a, a journalism exposes, it was found to be false. Uh, but by that stage, he'd been sent to Devil's Island, stripped of his commission, etc. Uh, and 
some Jews at the time, some Jewish intellectuals at the time, uh, became convinced because of incidents like this that they would never, uh, that 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 under current circumstances they would never be fully accepted as white Europeans, which is what they very much wanted. Uh, because Dreyfus, of course, had become a colonel in the French army. You can't do much more than that if you want to identify uh, with the European country you happen to be a, a citizen. Uh, and even he had been rejected, despite the fact that he was uh, he, he was eager to put, integrate into French society in that way. So they, they, they came to the conclusion that, in fact, uh, they were not going to be accepted under current circumstances. Now, you can react to that uh, by becoming uh, somebody who tries, if, if you like, to disengage, to say, well, if Europe doesn't like us, we won't like Europe and we'll go our own way. And very often, Zionism is, per, is presented in that light. It's presented as a Jewish attempt to say, well, you know, if you don't want us as European citizens, we'll go and be citizens of our own state. But in fact, if you look, and, and I do go into this at some length in the book, and I'm not going to belabor all of it except to give one or two examples. If you look at the early Zionist writing, two things are, are stand out. The first thing that stands out is that although Zionism is repeatedly presented as the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, that the Zionists don't seem to like Jewish people very much. Uh, uh, they, they, the right, uh, writings of early Zionism uh, are, are littered with uh, complaints uh, about Jews, uh, about how Jews are uh, parasitic, Jews do not contribute, all, all, all sorts of uh, racial slurs directed at Jews. And very often what the Zionists are saying is almost identical to what real anti-Semites are saying. They, the anti-Semites at the time who, who said all sorts of unpleasant things about Jews were very often echoed by the Zionists who said the same thing. The only difference between them is that, and the Zionists believe that Jews could be cured of their disease, if you like, by having a state. And it's very clear from the writings of the Zionists that the state they had in mind was a European state in the Middle East. And this is typified to me by uh, Herzl, Theodore Herzl, a, a, a Viennese journalist who, who became, in many people's views, the, the father of Zionism, uh, and who, who, who wrote several books on the topic. Herzl wrote a book called Alt Neuland, uh, Old New Land, which was a fictionalized novel type account of why there ought to be a Jewish state and what the Jewish state would look like. And the remarkable thing about Herzl's Jewish state in, in the Middle East is that its citizens speak German. Uh, they get dressed up in the evening in top hats and tails to go to the opera. And uh, he, he advises that the state ought to encourage dueling uh, because he says that adds an air of French refinement. Dueling, of course, being the ancient practice of people trying to kill each other because they believe they've been insulted, uh, which he saw as a, as a very noble European practice. So in other words, what he's trying to create is a European state in the Middle East. Um, so that's what the Zionists are trying to do. What is happening in Europe is that the prejudices persist. But we then have the 1930s and we have the Nazi genocide. And uh, European society or mainstream European society uh, begins uh, to be uh, aware, is made aware of the potential consequences of the kind of prejudices uh, which it has harbored in the past. That gives European society a reason for changing its attitudes to, to, to Jews. On the other hand, <laughs> there is the emergence of the Zionist movement and the demand for a, 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 a Jewish state. 
which in a sense gives European elites the best of both worlds because they can support Jews uh, and therefore distance themselves from the Nazis, uh, but they can encourage Jews to go somewhere else. And they can also encourage Jews to become representatives of the West in the Middle East. Now, unfortunately, when I wrote the book, uh, I hadn't been, well, it hadn't been published yet. A, a couple of weeks after I wrote the book, another book appeared on Germany and its attitude to the Israeli state, etc. And the book, for example, which I was obviously unable to use in my book, uh, actually quotes an exchange between Konrad Adenauer, who was the first chancellor of post-Nazi Germany, and uh, Ben Gurion, who was the Israeli prime minister, in which Adenauer says, we will always look after you. You are the West's representatives in the Middle East. You are our people in the Middle East. So you know, it can't be much more specific than that. Um, and, 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 and that has been repeated throughout uh, the, the period since 1948, when the state was responding. So in a sense, you have a certain kind of synergy. You have a synergy between uh, Jews who believe that the best way to become white Europeans is to start a state in the Middle East, uh, and Western elites uh, who want to encourage this because it meets both the objectives of, of protecting Western culture and Western interests and also uh, of, of uh, providing uh, some sort of alternative to the anti-Semitism problem. Uh, it, it ought to be mentioned in this respect, I mean, just to drive home the point, that the beginnings of Western exception, acceptance sorry, of, uh, of, of the Israeli state uh, was, of course, the Balfour Declaration, which was issued in 1917 by Arthur Balfour, who was then the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain. Uh, and <laughs> a few years earlier, Balfour had actually campaigned against Jewish immigration to the UK. Uh, he'd introduced very harsh immigration laws because he said, well, if you don't do this, you'll have Jews coming into the UK in, in too large numbers, etc. So in other words, the same politician who wanted to keep Jews out of, out of the UK is also the one who wants to give them a state in the Middle East. And it doesn't take too much imagination to realize that the two are connected, because if you do actually get them uh, out of the, 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 if you do actually get them a state in the Middle East, hopefully they won't have to immigrate to your country because they can go somewhere else. And what that means is that when people say anti-Semitic today, the term anti-Semitic has lost its meaning. That's why the title of the book refers to an assault on meaning, because it used to mean anti-Jewish racist. It now means opposition to the Israeli state, or more generally, opposition to the West, or what is seen as the mainstream view of the West. And I must make it clear, because the confusion, when I talk about the West, I'm, I'm talking about governments and elites, I'm not talking about citizens. Um, uh, the, the question of Western citizens is a totally different matter, and, and, and we're seeing at the moment uh, a widening gap between public opinion in the West and what the politicians do. Uh, but if we define the West as the politicians, then the claim that somebody is anti-Semitic today means rightly or wrongly uh, that they're pro-Palestinian, anti-the Israeli state, not sympathetic to the West. Uh, and whatever you think of being sympathetic or unsympathetic to the West, uh, clearly it's unconnected to the question uh, of, of, uh, of racism. Now, that's the general view. The what is happening, but also it affects, of course, not only the group's relationship to the rest of humanity, it also this uh, this new meaning of anti-Semitism affects what happens within the group. Now, if you if you try to understand where this idea of anti-Semitism, not as anti-Jewish racism, but as opposition to the Israeli state in the West comes from. There's no shortage of literature on the topic, and I quote the literature at great length in the book. Uh, I mean, for many years now, also interestingly, started around about the same time as those court cases in America that I was talking about. Uh, you find that there are writers in the United States primarily who are saying, no, well, we need to change what anti-Semitism means because there's a new anti-Semitism. 
And essentially, the new anti-Semitism is opposition to the Israeli state. And, and it leads to some very humorous and, and ridiculous outcomes in the sense that if you read the writings of the new anti, people who are writing about the new anti-Semitism, you discover that it is anti-Semitic, in other words, anti-Jewish, to be opposed to the electoral college in the United States. It's anti-Jewish to be opposed to nuclear power. Uh, the one writer, which is my favorite one, says that it is anti-Semitic to glorify peace and demonize war. So, you know, none of these things have anything at all to do with anti-Jewish racism. But what they do have a lot to do with is the strategic objectives of a particular state. Now, they claim, my reading of American politics is that they're wrong, but that doesn't alter the point. They claim that the Electoral College actually makes it easier to, 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 to lobby for the state of Israel. Uh, they claim uh, uh, that nuclear power uh, is useful because it uh, reduces the influence of oil and therefore the influence of Middle Eastern states. This is obviously before the process of normalization that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, and of course, demonizing uh, war and glorifying peace is a problem if you happen to have a very strong military uh, which you like to use against neighboring states. Now, the interesting part of this new anti-Semitism is that by changing what anti-Semitism means, it has a profound effect on what happens within the group, within the Jewish group. Because essentially what you're trying to do, instead of Jewishness being based on religion, or ethnicity, culture, all the things we usually associate with group identity and which have been central to Jewish identity since time immemorial, uh, all of those things are now secondary to the nationalism uh, and uh, the, the uniting everybody around the nationalist objection, uh, the objectives of the group. The irony of these attempts, and they're certainly not exclusive to the Jewish community by any manner of means, as I'm sure, I'm sure people can relate from their own situations, is that this kind of nationalist project has to present the idea of an entirely unified group, okay? The Jews are united. The current prime minister of the Israeli state has referred to himself on occasions as the leader of the Jewish people. Uh, uh, a claim which can only be, you know, a claim which is clearly false, seeing that, uh, you know, I think the last count about 70% of the Jewish people had, had never had the opportunity of voting for him, even if they wanted to, which in many cases they probably wouldn't. Uh, the point about his statement is that you try to unify the entire group. And in the process of trying to unify the entire, the entire group, you come across the obvious reality that some members of the group differ with you and therefore do not buy into your particular idea of what unity is all about. And therefore, you have to stigmatize members of your own group in order to in, in, claim to be unifying them, which is the kind of irony of, 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 of that particular type of nationalist project. And that is where the title of the book and the distinction between good Jews and bad Jews come up, comes in. Because you have to demonize the Jews who don't want to be part of the nationalist project uh, by saying that they're bad Jews, or in many cases that they're not Jews at all, despite the fact that they were born Jewish. And you land up stigmatizing, stigmatizing many members of your own group. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much out of time, so I don't want to go, but, but just on this question of stigmatizing members of the group, just to clarify, if, if that makes sense. To me, and I quote this in the book, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is vividly illustrated by the story of an 82-year-old woman called Diana Nesman. Well, I guess now she's 84, but she was then 82, um, who is a, a British Jewish person uh, she happens to be uh, very serious about her Jewishness. She's a very avid synagogue goer. She meticulously obeys the Jewish dietary laws, which incidentally most Zionists don't, but that's just by the way. Uh, Ms. Neslin was threatened with expulsion from the British Labour Party as an anti-Semite 
because she had posted something on Twitter now, which read, the state of Israel is a racist in endeavor and I am an anti-racist Jew. So, so for that, she was branded an anti-Semite, despite the fact that she is a more identified and more enthusiastic member of the group than the people who are accusing her. Now, there's a great deal else to this, but we have limited time. But I, uh, I think the central point that I'm, you know, there are all sorts of nuances of this we could go into. The central point that I'm trying to make is that uh, we live in a world at the moment in which prejudice is very often expressed, not in the old way, but in the new way of branding your critics as racist, uh, uh, claiming that people who want to challenge racial big bigotry are, 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 the, are, are the real racists. And secondly, the dangers of trying to impose on a particular group of people a, a, a unifying nationalist project which has to end up being more divisive uh, and, and denying the identity uh, of many members of that group because their political views or their lifestyles or their value systems uh, do not uh, coincide with that group. So I think I'll leave it there because of time constraints, but, but hopefully I've conveyed the main argument. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now, uh, I would like to open the floor for discussion, so feel, please feel free to ask a question or share your uh, thoughts or comments on what was presented by uh, raising your hand and waiting until you get the floor. You can also write questions or um, comments into the chat. Regarding the point of the order, I would like to ask all participants when asking questions or making comments to introduce themselves and state their uh, affiliation or country of residence. Also, we expect all participants to show respect for the views of others and invite uh, everybody to ex exercise decorum and avoid abusive or disrespectful language or derogatory and inflammatory remarks. So, do, does anybody have the questions? I see some hands raised. Okay, I suggest that we collect uh, two, three questions and Professor can answer them in the order that he uh, sees uh, uh, fit. So, uh, uh, Patricia, please, you can ask your question and then Dragan. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm from the US, so it's still very early here. I'm, I'm first and foremost, I'm sorry that my video is not on. As you can see, I'm still working with the kids on my morning duty. Um, Professor Fredman, good to see you again. It's been a long time. And um, thanks for the um, talk. It's very refreshing to hear from you. So um, what you've said, um, you said something about a lot of book coming out in this area. And I think I've got a glimpse. I also have to confess, I've not read your book, but after this talk, I'll make sure I get it. Um, yes, the US uh, is actually, in terms of what you just described, is quite tense at the moment, in the sense it's very hard, hard for people to actually discuss the what is going on at the moment between uh, Israeli and Palestine, or Hamas, will I call it, um, because of this labeling, because you are not, um, it's seem as if, it's not it's seem as if the narrative of trying to explain or in some way um, the humanity, bring up any kind of humanity, you are tagged anti Semitics, which is quite ironic. So, um, but also I have observed something. I don't have any systematic research. I've not done any systematic research, neither have I come across any systematic research. I have, uh, but I've observed there are some backlashes over this type of um, reframing of anti-Semitism, which is you are not allowed to criticize or even be neutral about Israeli government action at the moment. That's number one. Uh, then number two, the whole idea of anti-Semitism at the moment is very, very, um, I think, cross 
road in the US, given that, especially at universities, that um, faculty are not even free to discuss anything about uh, what is going on. Um, a lot of people avoid it. So I want to know what is your take on this? Because yes, on a global level, we know what is going on. But on the micro level, especially for those of us in the US, is actually more toxic, more toxic, toxic, especially at the university level. It's quite um big because another thing is that there's a lot of threat by those uh, against any criticism of um Israeli state. So everybody's been very, very careful. Uh, thank you, Dragan. Uh, yes, um, good day. Um, thank you so much for the for the talk, um, Professor Friedman. Uh, I just wanted to say, having spent ten wonderful years in South Africa, you know, I was a reader of yours, uh, especially you know, in the Daily Maverick. I may not have always uh, agreed with your views, but I know I was guaranteed an interesting perspective uh, on current affairs, especially uh, South African affairs. So yeah, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I would like to take a more uh, German-centric um, uh, approach and maybe get your take um, on, on the following. First of all, I really enjoyed um, uh, how you arrived uh, at the conclusion that uh, in today's world, an anti-Semite can be someone who actually deep down despises the Jewish people and therefore is very pro-Israeli. <laughs> Um, or, or actually, pardon, uh, the people who oppose anti-Semitism. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit of a mind bender, but I can see that there is a very interesting perspective. Um, I just recently read an article which, in summary, spoke about um, how even uh, German jewelry are getting fed up with uh, the approach that the German um, state takes to anti-Semitism. So, of course, you mentioned that since Adenauer, Adenauer and especially then Angela Merkel, you know, this sense of special responsibility towards Israel was cemented, um, you know, stressing that its security is also part, it's also a part of Germany's own, you know, quote, reason of state, unquote. And even ironically, um, uh, parties painted as neo-Nazis, such as alternative for Germany, are in line with this doctrine, uh, at least some sections uh, of them. You know, they in uh, in 2019, I remember they instigated a motion to ban the movement to boycott Israel, which is yeah, an in interesting duality. Um, just recently, uh, I read that um, in Berlin, some establishment which hosted uh, Israeli NGOs with you know holding views not too dissimilar to yours, Professor Friedman have had their funding severed by the local government following probes from the government-appointed anti-Semitism commissioners. Um, the same also similar cases involve poets and artists, some of whom are actually Jewish, um, and organizations uh, also in Germany relying, relying on state subsidies have been scrutinized over suspicions that you know, they cross, cross the bureaucracy's rather vaguely defined lines of um, anti-Semitism. And this, uh, you know, one-sided si embrace of Israel has um, sort of, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, put the German state at odds with the German Jewelry. Um, a, a German composer uh, and a, you know, a Jewish person himself argued that, uh, whose name I'm blanking out on now, I'm afraid, argued that being told how to be Jewish by the state is itself a form of anti-Semitism. So, uh, you know, uh, they say, you know, when a friend is drunk, you don't you don't offer them another drink. You drive them home and put them to bed. But Germany seems to be the other type of friend, the enabler. So um, I wanted to I wanted to maybe get your your perspective on the above and also um, ask you maybe for your opinion, what role should Germany play in this, should should Germany now can it break free from the clutches of the past and become a critical friend of Israel? And you know, considering the reverence that the founders of Israel had for the German culture, how do you think 
that uh, criticism would be perceived by Israeli society and maybe by the global uh, jury. Thank you so much. Thank you both Patricia and Dragan for asking uh, questions and sharing your opinions. Uh, professor, can you re reflect on them and uh, share with us what is your take on it? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Dragan, I, if you'd agreed with them, <laughs> it would be very boring if you'd agreed with everything I said. So thanks for reading it, whether you agreed or not. Uh, and Patricia, of course, as she pointed out, uh, have, has, was played an important role in some work I did with colleagues in the US. So nice to hear from you again. Uh, I think I, I do want to talk specifically about Germany, but I, I think what is happening in the US and Germany um, is ironically, uh, and this is a post October the 7th reflection. I mean, the book was written before October the 7th, so, so I didn't have the material at that stage. Uh, but I think that what is, you know, I talked earlier about the way in which divisions were imposed on the Jewish group by uh, the supporters of the Israeli state. And I think that there's a similar internal polarization happening in, in Europe and the US at the moment. And, and that polarization has to do with West, with, with what are very often described as Western values. And some of us could argue about whether they're Western values or not, but, but values which certainly, if you look at my CV and my work on democracy, values which I am very proud to subscribe to, uh, uh, basic principles of, 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 of equality and fairness, et cetera, et cetera. And those values, whether we agree that they're Western or not, uh, are, are very often presented as Western and are very often accepted by most citizens of the West as Western. And that leads to a situation which is what we've been seeing for much of the last three months, in which, on the one hand, you have the situation in which the people with power, and I'm thinking particularly of governments, but also the media get, get buy into this and, and other people buy into it, have, in a sense, violated every one of these principles uh, in the name of defense of the Israeli state. So, so you take, you know, if we assume for a moment that, uh, you know, equality, fairness, freedom of speech, all of those important principles uh, are part of what the West feels it ought to be about. All of those are being violated at the moment, and, and Dragan described the way in which they're being violated in Germany, uh, and not only in Germany. Um, and it's not only that principle which is being violated. I could go on for ages. I mean, whatever you, you know, however much violence Hamas committed on the October the 7th, it's, it's a basic principle that you don't inflict collective punishment. You don't punish the innocent for what the guilty have done. And yet it is accepted, and we see the images the whole time, that thousands of women and children can be murdered for what uh, a, a group of men with guns did. Uh, that's not a democratic principle at all. And so we could go on silencing people who engage. I mean, the, the assault on the boycott movement. Uh, I mean, boycotts are an intrinsic part of a democratic society. It's a it's a basic freedom to decide what you want to buy and what you don't want to buy. Uh, and yet that has been vilified as well. And what that leads to is a situation in which uh, the elites seem to have a very instrumental view to these values, about these values, in the sense that they could be jettisoned when they're inconvenient. But most citizens <laughs> accept those values. And when most citizens see women and children being killed for what uh, 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 some men with arms did, uh, and see hospitals being invaded by men in uniform and schools destroyed and mosques and churches being destroyed, those citizens react in the way in which those values say they should react. And they become very angry and they want to cease fire. Um, and that is, that is what is happening in Europe at the moment. And it's not the first time because I'm South African, as you know. Uh, and this is part of the South African experience as well. Uh, because, you know, Western governments, despite what you read now, were not unhappy with apartheid in South Africa. Uh, 
the more information got out, Western citizens became very angry with apartheid in South Africa, and they formed uh, associations which expressed that anger, etc. And I think that's what's beginning to emerge now. So on the one hand, you're seeing in both the US and Germany and other parts of Europe, etc., uh, you, you, you're seeing the refusal of the elites to accept principles like freedom of speech, like uh, the absence of collective punishment, only punishing the guilty, not punishing the innocent, etc. And you find citizens uh, have, having the opposite view uh, and, 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 and saying, no, this is unacceptable behavior. Uh, and I, I think increasingly uh, people, the, the, the politicians are going to, to, to have to deal with this. Uh, I, you know, they met and, and, you know, Patricia was talking about the US, we can be very, you know, and there have been headlines about it. The current American president may lose the election because of this, um, uh, for two reasons. First of all, because the way the American, very odd American electoral system works, you have this idea of swing states. Uh, it doesn't matter what the majority do, particular states vote a particular way. Uh, and there are, 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 are state, there are a couple of states in America where Arab Americans may reject Biden and, and cost him the election. And also, which is perhaps more relevant to what I'm saying, uh, he's losing young people's support because young people are saying, well, we're not going to vote for you if you support this kind of uh, behavior. So uh, I think that's something to, 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 to watch out for. There's obviously a specific German component to this. And, and of course, the German component is, uh, you know, you, you can take two views on the German component, quite frankly, and I've heard both views. The one is uh, it doesn't alter the reality, but the one is more sympathetic than the other. The more sympathetic one is that uh, this is born out of a sense of guilt for the Nazi genocide that you know Germany, what Germany, what Germany's leaders did uh, in, in in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, if that is the case, the obvious criticism, which is made repeatedly, is why should Palestinian women and children have to pay the price for what a particular generation of German leaders did? Uh, the other view is, uh, which is part of that book that I was talking, and it comes up in the book that I was talking about, is that uh, you've simply seen a, a shift in the prejudice. The prejudice used to be directed against Jews. Uh, it's now directed against Muslims and Arabs, uh, and, and, and uh, you, can, you can behave in much the same way. I, th I think one of the th what, you know, way in which this is going to develop, because Dragan asks, well, can Germany break free from this? Um, of course, Germany can break free from this, but I don't think that politicians are going to break Germany free from this, quite frankly. Uh, I think that German citizens may do that. Um, and if German citizens don't do that, it remains much the same, because that's what happened in my country. Uh, because <clears throat> the, perhaps the defining moment of the fight against, uh, to persuade people internationally that apartheid was evil, uh, was an event called Sharpeville in which, uh, in 1960, in which police shot dead pro unarmed protesters. What we found in that situation is the year after Sharpeville, Britain was prepared to get, make, allow South Africa to become a republic, despite the fact that only whites had been allowed to vote in the, in the referendum, and it was quite clear that the republic would discriminate against 90% of the population. However, when, 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 when Western citizens saw what was being done in Sharpeville, uh, you found uh, that they began to, to, to express their displeasure, uh, and, and this, this played itself out over several years. And I think that's what's going to happen in Germany and the US. I think that you're going to increasingly find uh, that if you are a citizen of the US or Germany who embraces democratic values, you are going to be critical of your government's stance on, on, on this question, and you are going to start pressurizing your government to change. Um, thank you for your uh, answers and comments. We have another question in the chat. I, I don't know if I can ask Marwan if uh, they want to ask in person or should I read it? Marwan, are you with us? Yeah, you, you can read it. Okay. Then sorry for calling you out. I just wanted to give you a chance also to ask in person. Okay, so Marvani is asking how um, the um, anti-Zionist Jews conduct a unified uh, effort that can challenge the new anti-Semitic definition in the West uh, 
uh, uh, conduct. How how can uh, I'm sorry? How can the uh, uh, those uh, Jews opposing Zionist uh, make an effort to challenge the new anti-Semitic uh, definition in the West? And I am just looking. Does anybody else has a question or wants to comment? If not, uh, can I also add one of my my question, which is also uh, concerned with the anti-Semitic definition? If nobody opposes, okay. So, um, Professor, you were writing in your book uh, about uh, uh, how the international Holocaust remembers alliances. Uh, Working definition on the Holocaust yeah. can be used to target critics of the Israeli state, and it can be misused for political different political reasons. And then you were also making their distinction between, I quote, legitimate criticism of the Israeli government, uh, end of quote, versus anti-Semitism. And I would like you like to ask you if you could specify what this legitimate criticism of the Israeli government, and I'm adding also policies. Uh, uh, includes in your opinion, and can you share some example examples of it? And maybe if you could extend it to the current uh, Israeli intervention in Gaza. Yeah, just uh, before I, I'll answer your question before I answer my one's question. Um, I, 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 that's not my view. I mean, my view is not that there's legitimate or illegitimate criticism of the Israeli state. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe in free speech. Uh, there's no such thing as illegitimate criticism. There may be criticism which many people don't agree with, but that's a different matter. Uh, no, the point that I'm making is that whatever your position on the Israeli state, it is clearly invalid to, uh, to lump together a state and an ethnic group. Uh, so if I say that I don't like the way uh, in which Muslims are treated in Germany, uh, does that mean I'm anti-German? Does that mean I hate Germans? Does that mean I harbor racial prejudice against Germans? No, it means that I disagree with a particular attitude which I believe Germans happen to hold. And you cannot, okay, so I'm a, I, I happen to be Jewish. Um, whether I support the Israeli state or not in a democratic society is my choice. Uh, and if I choose to oppose uh, the, the, the Israeli state, that doesn't mean I cease to be Jewish. It means I have a different opinion from some other people. Uh, and this idea that you can simply assume that everybody of a particular ethnic group must identify with a particular state is quite, is, is precisely that which I mentioned in the in the book and in the talk, which divides people, which, you know, well, you're not a real Jew because you don't support the Israeli state. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think it's very important to make the point that everybody, you know, people who criticized apartheid in South Africa were not anti-white. They didn't hate white people. They were opposed to discrimination. And I think that the situation in, in, in that respect is exactly the same. Um, so when, you know, people get accused, you know, and it doesn't matter whether it's legitimate or not. I mean, just before I came on air here, uh, there's yet another dispute in Harvard, which should surprise nobody because this is a sort of ongoing saga. And there's a picture, there's a, the, the, the dispute here is that there's a so-called anti-Semitic cartoon. And if you have a look at it, it may not be the most tasteful cartoon you've ever seen, but it quite clearly refers to the state. It doesn't refer to Jewish people at all. So it's not an anti-Semitic cartoon. You can say it's a bad cartoon or you don't like the message it sent. Um, but when you have a picture of uh, a pair of hands which which have the Israeli flag uh, portrayed on them, uh, doing violence to people, you're not saying that Jews do violence to people, you're saying the Israeli state does violence to people. Um, and I think this has become much, it's been placed in much sharper focus since uh, what is what has happened in Gaza started, because part of we get now to Marwan's question. I mean, one of the developments which which underlines my argument in the book, uh, one of the de developments which are very interesting in 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 some important parts of the world, and Dragan referred to this in some of the responses of, of German Jews to some of the things that are going on at the moment, um, is uh, 
a, a significant growth uh, in, 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 in Jews who take a public stand critical of the Israeli state. Um, this is a big, big issue in the US at the moment. I mean, you have cases in which, uh, you know, groups of rabbis have stood with people and got got arrested for passive resistance, demanding a ceasefire. Uh, you've had pictures in the UK of uh, people in, you know, in, in the traditional uh, garb that, that Jews put on when they pray, uh, praying uh, for Palestinian uh, safety uh, in British public places, etc. So essentially, this is becoming a trend. And it illustrates the point that I'm making. These are these are Jewish people who are proud to be Jewish, who want to be Jewish, but who don't support a particular state. And what is interesting about this, and you know, Patricia asked about the US, etc., is that you know, if you, you the interesting thing about opinion polls, what opinion polls are showing in the US is not only uh, that they show uh, majority public support for uh, a ceasefire and for humanitarian intervention. Uh, it's that opinions among Jews about the Israeli state are shifting dramatically. Now, it's worth mentioning, incidentally, that some of these views were never what people said they were in the first place. One of the great myths of American politics is that the Jewish vote ensures that the president will always support the Israeli state. That's false. That, the, the, the polls show that it's false. Uh, just as one example, in, in, a rec in a poll conducted about 18 months ago, uh, the percentage of American Jews who said that the president's stance on the Israeli state determined which they would vote was 4%. Okay. So 96% do not regard that as a reason for voting for a particular candidate. But what we're seeing now is that uh, that's becoming much more overt. Uh, so that, first of all, and, and it is very much an age divide. So the younger, the younger Jewish, you know, the, the younger Jewish cohorts, etc., um, criticism of the Israeli state, uh, non-identification with the Israeli state, is growing. Uh, so that I mean, just to quote some numbers and get a sense of feel for what's going on, uh, twenty-five percent of American Jews uh, under the age of 30 now believe that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, but the more interesting figure beyond the 25%, which may not sound a lot, but historically it's immense because the figure 10 years ago would have been 3%, uh, is that if you ask young American Jews whether they identify with the state of Israel, then only a minority do so. Uh, only around 30% actually identify with the state. So in other words, there are increasing opportunities uh, for Jews who are critical of the Israeli state uh, to win support among fellow Jews. And there's one, if you, if you want to get a sense of where the conflict uh, in, in, uh, in that part of the world may be going over the next few years, I think there's something very interesting, you know, as speaking as a South African, something very interesting difference between the situation of South Africa and the Israeli state. I mean, in many respects, the Israeli state has got advantages which apartheid South Africa didn't have. But the disadvantage it has, I, I, I have a chapter in the book making the point, among other things, uh, that no Jewish state in history has ever survived without the support of a much more powerful state. Uh, and this goes back to, to biblical time. Um, and that means that what happens in the Middle East and what the, the Israeli state does depends very much on what happens in other parts of the world. And if you'd said to people in South Africa during apartheid that you could get rid of apartheid by politely persuading white South Africans that they shouldn't behave in this way, you wouldn't have been taken seriously and rightly so. And if you were to go to the state of Israel today and somehow get to you know, go, go, go communicate with 90% uh, of the Israeli Jewish population and tell them that they should change what they're doing, uh, you wouldn't get much of a hearing either. However, if you look at those other states, 
and you look at the role of Jewish communities in those other states, they're not in the same position as Israeli Jews. And they're not the same position as white South Africans were. Because quite frankly, if you're a Jew living in New York or California, what happens in the Middle East does not affect your daily life. You carry on as much as you did the day before, whatever happens. And you don't devise, you don't devise, derive any status and you don't derive any privileges uh, from, from, from the fact that there's a state. And therefore, I think that what we are going to see over the next while or so is a significant shift of opinion within Jewish communities living outside the state of Israel, which inevitably must affect what governments do and will over time, hopefully, and I'm prepared to run, have the, the, the same effect as it had in my country, which is to bring people to the negotiating table to really negotiate a shared future uh, rather than to pretend to do so. So, so. so I think we are living in, 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 in times of change on this issue, and that's how I, I envisage the change unfolding. Thank you. Uh, continuing with another question from the chat. First, uh, uh, Muhammad is sharing with us his uh, his opinions. Opinion that he, he is uh, amazed when two million billion Muslims are insulted in the name of freedom of expression. If a racist Jew is opposed by another person, he is trolled in the name of uh, anti-Semitism. And uh, then he mentions actually what you were professor or mentioning that Semites are also Arabs. And then he asked why uh, that if he's not mistaken, basically both Arabs and Jews are Semitic. So uh, it's just uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. So why aren't Arabs included in this racially? Uh, uh, they are both part of it. So. Um, uh, what is the reason for this discrimination, he asked you, and uh, expect some guidance from you on okay. the topic? Well, I mean, my first point is that I, I, I mean, the observations he makes are accurate. I, I, we, we're, we're, we're in agreement on this issue. But why does this come about? Well, it comes about, quite frankly, and there's a history to this, which I mentioned in the book, um, it comes about from a period of time in which the, we, the term racism, which we hear very frequently today, today usually means prejudice against black people, against darker skinned people, etc. The term racism actually emerged in the 19th, in, in the 1930s in the US and Europe, and it didn't refer to that at all. The only thing it referred to was prejudice against Jews. And so that the entire idea emerged from a Western perspective uh, and a perspective in which people outside the West were simply excluded from the conversation. There were Jews in Europe at the time. That's why the anti-racism uh, ideas emerged. Uh, but there were no, there were very few Arabs or Muslims. And therefore, the Jews, if you like, were the Semites in the European world. Uh, and because only the European world was assumed to matter in this debate, uh, the term became anti-Semitism. Um, but of course, it shouldn't have been. Um, I mean, I was in two minds when I, you know, when I was writing the book, because on the one hand, I, 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 you know, I think, you know, as I say, there are some very mainstream Jewish scholars of anti-Semitism who think it's, it's, it's an inaccurate term. Uh, I mean, a more precise term would be anti-Jewish racism. Uh, and some, somebody has suggested Judeophobia, you know, just as there's Islamophobia directed as Muslims. But that's what we've been stuck with for the moment, and the history I've just given is why we stuck with it at the moment. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Uh, does anybody else want to still ask, Professor? Ah, yes, there is my colleague, Mirsad, please. Yes, uh, hello, everybody. 
and Dr. Friedman, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question for you as I was reading uh, uh, parts of your book. Um, uh, there is, uh, how you say, you know, that third party that is um, that is very important. And as one author have said, it is too large to be seen. And that third party is basically so-called Western audience. Even this conversation is, interestingly, who, who is the main audience for us? In your book, you do say that your book may be relevant for South African context, right? And that's that's obviously, you know, from your standpoint, standpoint important. But actually, who do you think globally is the audience for this conversation and for your book as well? Um, and then the second reflection I have, I have written a book about Bosnian Muslims, Bosniaks, and they have a similar situation just like Arabs, like they are, uh, they are basically canceled on both levels. They canceled both as Slavs, even though they are Slavs, right? And they are also canceled on the religious grounds because they are of the wrong religion in, in, in Europe. And so we see how these themes, you know, persist continuously. You know, I, I did talk to you and I shared to you with you that uh, article that uh, is quite an interesting one from 1869 published by Anthropological Review, which talks about the same attitudes, like from 1869, except now, you know, wrapped up in a different, how you say, tone and with different, described with different words. But, you know, I'm just constantly thinking, okay, who is the main audience? Why do we have to compete for these positive views by that so-called main audience? So um, do, you, do you see that, um, it, you know, as you said, we live in the time of changes, can we expect that this global north and global south, you know, finally meet, and, and that uh, you know, implicit, constant appeal to the global south, please see me and accept me, and look, I'm beautiful just like you, you know, is that ever going to stop? Yeah, you know, is it going to be ever resolved that tension between the global south and global north? And that's what I was thinking as as I was reading your book, which, by the way, I recommend to everybody. It's an excellent work. I very much appreciate stuff I learned from the book, and I, I was just reflecting as I was reading. So I hope it makes sense what I'm trying to say. But it's my lots of stuff is going through my head as I'm listening, and I said, okay, let me just use the opportunity to ask you. No, it does. Uh, it, it it does make sense. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the article. Um, yeah, just before I answer your question, I I do need to understand more about Bosniaks because. Uh, I mean, I just have this, I don't claim to be an authority, but it, it just seems to me as an outsider, I mean, obviously what you say is true, but that they don't meet quite the same anti-Muslim prejudice as other Muslims because uh, because they are European. But uh, I may have to revise that on the basis of what you said. I mean, they were obviously treated appallingly, but, uh, uh, you know, you didn't... I. I may not have read, read, read the right things, but I, I didn't come across the same sort of stereotypes about them as I do did about other Muslims. But I, I do need to find out more about that. So, so thank you for that. Who is it intended to look? As I said earlier, I mean, you know, it is it is a tender. I'm I'm trying to reach uh, people who who are concerned about the kind of issues I'm concerned about, uh, democracy, freedom, peace, and all those, those good things, but uh, those good things are under threat in the world at the moment. And uh, although I'm not making any heroic claims on behalf of, of one book by one individual sitting in South Africa, I mean, I did say in, in, in my response to Marwan that I, uh, uh, I do believe uh, and it's also implicit in what I said to Dragan and Tricia, is that I do believe that it is possible to shift opinion on this issue. Um, because, A, as I said before, uh, a lot of people, uh, I, you know, who may go along with the mainstream view on this issue do so, not because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, their, it's their inclination, but simply because they haven't uh, and that's not a criticism, it's just a reality. They haven't informed themselves on the issue. And if you make information available to people, uh, 
uh, they they may well change their position. I mean, I've certainly had people say since I read the book, uh, you know, there were things in there I just didn't know, and thank you. So that's good. Uh, and secondly, as I said before, uh, I think that there is this conflict at the moment uh, in the West um, between, uh, you know, this idea that uh, that the West does and should stand for uh, the kind of values which I certainly espouse and, and the fact that in its behavior, it very often doesn't. Uh, and I, I think that that's a very fertile uh, place for discussion. And, and, and you know, it, it also raises the whole question of, uh, of double standards. There's, there's a wonderful quote which sort of illustrates it. There's a wonderful quote in the book. It's, it's, I mean, it takes us into the whole other sort of discussion, but it, it conveys part of what I'm trying to say. I mean, there is a section in the book on India uh, comparing uh, uh, Narendra Modi with Zionism and, and, and so on. And uh, I make a liberal use of a man called uh, Ashish Nandi, who is a, an Indian intellectual, uh, who's written a very important book about colonization. Uh, and Nandi says somewhere in the book um, that what, in, what unofficial India, in other words, you know, Indian history, etc., what unofficial India is doing is holding Western values in trust until the West is once again able to receive them, which is a very interesting insight. And I think it, it's, it's, it's one which will probably form the theme of another book I want to write. Uh, but what he's saying, of course, is that, you know, the West is not simply, but the, but besides, despite some of the attitudes we sometimes see in which you know, one group of people's lives matter a great deal and other people's lives don't matter at all. Uh, you know, the West is not this uh, you know, kind of collection of deeply bigoted people who, um, you know, the majority of people buy into those values. And, and, and if the politicians and the media people are not actually remaining consistent to those values, uh, then I think they'll be held court to account by, by, by the citizenry. So... It's a modest attempt to encourage people in the English speaking world, because it is obviously written in English, um, to look at this question in a new way uh, to the one that, that they probably get if they switch on their television sets and uh, in that way to, to shift public opinion. Um, and, and I make no heroic claims about my ability to do that, but I think it's worthwhile trying and, and making whatever contribution you can to the Okay, thank you. Does anybody else has uh, still wants to ask something? Okay, so before closing, uh, can I use also this opportunity, Professor, to ask you one more question? Yes. Uh, uh, although you actually answered on more than I had prepared, but uh, uh, I don't know um, uh, if you uh, remember um, uh, uh, how how we met? I suppose you remember that we met at the uh, Brown International Advanced Research Institute. Uh, it was a program on ethnicity, uh, inequality, and conflict in global perspective, um, conveyed with distinguished professor uh, Glenn Laurie, Professor Ashutosh Varshney that you quote in your, uh, that you cite in your book, and also Professor Patricia Agutkusi. Was with her, I stayed in contact and we cooperate. She is also senior research associate at Miri, so I'm very happy about that. And by mentioning uh, that uh, you were there uh, lecturing us and you were my peer for my project that was referring to the multiple identifications of the members of Slovak national minority in Serbia. But you told me that time something that I cherished since. You said that always when I present my research, I have to make clear why something that matters to me should matter to the other. So actually, I uh, wanted to ask you in the similar manner, which is, is something also uh, what Mirsad was asking about your audience, but I want to ask about the impact of your book. What do you think? Um, you already mentioned that you are glad when it changes some uh, some views. So my question was relating to 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 the uh, to influence of your book not only for the research but for the practice. Uh, like, uh, do you uh, have any expectations that can change the the uh, public discourses about uh, anti-Semitism? Uh, but you uh, so any in 
or uh, you know in what kind of way it should change if yes but uh, you partially answered that but the second thing what i wanted um I uh, wanted to ask you, you were speaking about how people can be stigmatized for their opinions, expressing on what is happening on Israeli politics and so on. And it's uh, uh, it's a question that uh, like, did you, were you ever stigmatized for, for example, even for this work that you published or maybe for, for your work in the past, if you could share with us and then we are wrapping up, thank you. Okay, yes, look, I am trying to change public opinion very clearly and, and, and across the board. Um, I mean, I've had some very interesting, you know, when I talk about, I've had some very interesting engagements with, with, with Muslim groups since, since I wrote the book. Um, uh, some of whom have said, look, you know, I mean, they're entitled to come to any conclusion they like, have said, look, you know, we didn't know this stuff. <laughs> and it changes our perception. Um, because I think that, you know, just a, a comment on that, I, 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 I think that's a very important part of what I'm trying to achieve, because it is so easy for this, this very damaging conflict, which is, is, is awful enough as it is, uh, to become uh, a, a vehicle for very stereotyped views of, of who people are, etc. Um, you know, and, and it's not helped by the fact that that on the Jewish side, uh, the, the, the pro-Israeli side, you're continually told, uh, you know, which is, I didn't mention that in my talk, which is itself anti-Semitic in my view, you know, you're told you have to support violence. Well, why should, you know, <laughs> the idea that Jews should be, are only really Jewish if they support violence is offensive. Uh, because that doesn't define your identity. So I think there are a lot of conversations to be had. And, and what I tried to do was introduce a way of looking at the issue, which was not, you know, yet another one, you know, which in a free society is acceptable, but, you know, another restatement of one side's position or the other side's position. I wanted to come from it uh, in a totally different way. And, and hopefully if it, you know, uh, Changing public opinion would be nice, but even if it just opens up new conversations, I think that would be very valuable. As far as my own experience is concerned, I mean, you know, I, I one of the great ironies is that for, for half my life, I lived in a country which was, uh, you know, a sort of a deeply undemocratic uh, state in which 10% of the population uh, suppressed everybody else. Uh, and for the last 30 years, I've lived in a democracy which at the moment is far more democratic than most of the older democracies. So, you know, you don't get, I mean, the kind of pressure which people, which has been described, you know, Patricia was talking about, Dragon was talking about, and others, uh, which you 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 experience in, in your environments uh, is virtually non-existent here. I mean, I think two years ago or three years ago, uh, some people who didn't like things I'd written about the Israeli state tried to get me fired from my university. And I discovered afterwards that the vice chancellor hadn't even bothered to reply to things that he wanted to talk about with anybody. Um, uh, on the other hand, yes, I mean, there has been a, a, a reaction, but interestingly, uh, as an academic, <laughs> I find that most of the reaction, most of the negative reaction, I mean, if, if I've paid a professional price for taking a position, <coughs> it's been in the international sphere, not in the South African sphere. I mean, there's no professional opportunity which has ever been closed to me in my own country as a result of the position I've taken. Uh, but I have been excluded from international projects because of, I've, I mean, this is a, the book is new, but the position is long-standing. Um, and of course, I have a personal battle, which is, 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 you know, besides the fact that I'm an academic, I'm also a human being, and I'm a Jewish human being, and I happen to be one of those Jewish human beings who thinks, who, who wants to identify as Jewish, uh, and that makes things very difficult. Uh, so I have, I have lots of problems with my own community, <laughs> but not with my country's government. Uh, sorry to hear that, but uh, I hope that you you state, um, um, you know, uh, that you uh, uphold it to your integrity and moral values and 
that can be some award to you. And I had also another question. What, what do you think? Uh, how should intellectuals and social scientists, uh, what kind of role we should play? Should we engage when some atrocities, uh, uh, conflicts are happening, when uh, civilians die and fundamental uh, human rights are endangered? But you answered, obviously, uh, uh, with uh, with the things that you uh, that you do so thank you for that and uh, uh, let me then uh, conclude that today uh, we could have uh, heard from professor how the understandings of uh, anti-semitism has been evolving and changed to include not only hostility towards the jews but also to the opposition of the israeli state and uh, uh, many uh, other things uh, uh, professor has explained us about the new anti-Semitism um, and um, about uh, the Israelis' ethnic nationalistic project. Uh, so uh, I'm very glad that uh, today's uh, discussion was about uh, thoughtful questioning and inquiring about the book rather than uh, arguing for some positions that we think that they are the only correct ones. So thank you all participants for constructive contributions to the conversations on Professor's book. And I think that we have learned a lot and advanced our understanding on this topic. And I really, I read all the book. I even uh, already have written a book review and I, I can only recommend to everyone. And uh, at the end, again, uh, dear Professor Stephen, thank you so much for your time and willingness to talk about your book at MIRI seminar. And uh, to the others, it was really wonderful to see uh, um, so many of you from different parts of the world uh, that have joined. So thank you and uh, uh, goodbye. And thank you all for the opportunity. It was a, it was a very enriching discussion, so thanks.